Okay, so today we have Dr. Astrid Stuckelberger, a an international health expert, a scientist, an author, a public speaker, and somebody that governments and organizations go to for advice. So taking all that in board, welcome, Dr. Astrid. Um, how would you like to introduce yourself <laughs> with all these titles? Yes. Uh, so hello, everybody. Thank you, uh, Sira, to welcome me in this um, in, in this show. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, how I'd like to introduce myself. Um, what I'd like to say is that I have been in science for more than 25 years at the University of Geneva, Lausanne, and other universities doing PhD. Another yeah. kind of PhD in medicine, faculty of medicine, it's called a priva docent. But um, if I could just say it in one sentence first is that I'm passionate about science in all areas, actually, especially what we don't know. <laughs> but it's yeah. also to give an explanation, a coherent explanation to how the world works, uh, to how we can preserve our health, how we can increase our health, what are the mm -hmm. factors that bring you to a happy aging, a happy life or a non-happy, what are the factors that we can change? So when I started studying biology, I was like fascinated by finding out what can you change and what can you not change in your destiny? about yep. everything that about health and medicine, it started to be really my focus very early on. Mm -hmm. So that's so, one. <laughs> and then maybe so, I could say that I, I've been, um, I have like 10, 12 books, uh, French, English, German, that more and more I will write about this uh, new medicine. And I'm very keen on innovation. And that's, uh, we will discuss uh, this. And I've been expert in, um, the United Nations, you know, naturally I'm in Geneva, uh, Geneva, uh, Switzerland, and I live like 10 minutes from the United Nations. I can see the flag almost every day. And um, I've, I've been like a natural uh, member of the family of WHO and the uh, United Nations. So I've worked extensively on the ethics committee, on aging and health, on organizing the UN Open Days, participating as an expert, as a non-governmental organization with science, uh, input and um, creating events or participating to events in a very eclectic way, not always only health, as health yeah. is not just about medicine. Health is about social determinants of health. It about, it's about law. It is about the right to uh, citizens. It is about water, food, you know. So And a healthy attitude, uh, which I know you're very keen to promote that a lot of, uh, shall we say, a lot of immunity can get be brought to you as a person by the attitude that you have in doing things. Yes. Yes, in science, and that's where it's fascinating. Um, we thought that the genome, your DNA, your genetic making determines mm -hmm. your health and your aging and that you can't do anything. Well, the research showed something completely new uh, in the last, last 10 years in public health and health and medicine. It's called epigenetic what is above yep. the gene, the expression of your gene, which is like a library. And in that way, 75%, it's been proven and studied 75%. on 75% of your destiny of health is in your hands. It can be changed. Only 25% are really determined by your gene, but the rest you can change. And one of the factor is subjectivity. That was my PhD actually wow. on subjective health versus objective health. Because your subjectivity, your subjective health, how you subjective poverty, subjective wealth is what creates your happiness uh, also and, and the factors of your health. So we mm -hmm. can call it perception, subjectivity, emotion. It's everything that starts from you in the morning when you wake up <laughs> and when you go to sleep. And then the second is lifestyles and that's nutrition, what you eat every day creates your health or your disease, the way you eat it, what type of food you eat. And then you have uh, physical exercise. And this also, if you are uh, sedentary or mobile, you create and activate 
and we generate much more or much less and you create. And then the third one, we can go in details later, is the social determinants and environmental determinants of your health, which means it's the air you breathe, it is uh, the pollution outside, how much sun you have, um, you know, all the environment where you live, is, is, is your habitat healthy? Do you do you open the window and breathe? You know, <laughs> so it, to, to make it simple, that's very important to understand that health is in your hands. Indeed, um, you've been very influential and obviously involved in coronavirus, um, particularly with the coronavirus uh, virus joint uh, task force, uh, the American one uh, in, in American Association of Precise Medicine. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because obviously you're in contact at the front line of these mm. things, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> well, it's uh, not that I wanted it. It is like uh, it was very natural to get involved because I have worked with WHO for three years, even another year with the European uh, headquarters but in Geneva yes, yes. on pandemic preparedness, monitoring, surveillance, detection, communication. And we put um, in place an extensive course of one year online and residential for the member states and for the epidemiologists in the world with Georgetown University and Pretoria University. And I was mm -hmm. representing the University of Geneva. So uh, yes, I could not but not help explain ask questions. And uh, Edward Muzinski from Telewellness, my colleague, he, he um, brought me to APM and they accepted me right away in the task force is the American Association of Precision Medicine. So that was yep. in April, March, 2020. Yep. Uh, I started being a part and trying to find solutions on um, detecting and monitoring the virus COVID-19 in settings like restaurants, hotels, and what can we do um, to get back to normal? Right. Yeah, that was um, quite an also, I think that you, since you mentioned it, the UK is trying to set up its own uh, task force for antivirals, and I, I'm hoping that they will try and gain knowledge from people like yourself, because you're very, uh, very much on the side of shall we say, inclusiveness, sharing information about how things could be helped when doing things and particularly relating to COVID-related material. Yes. Yeah, the, the idea is, is I, I'm very based on ethics all the time. That's one of my policy in life is um, you do good for the people, try to yeah. find the best solution for everyone, uh, also politically. Um, then you do no harm. So anything you do, if you communicate, you don't do harm, you don't create fear, uh, you, you try and make people feel good, so no harm. And then mm -hmm. justice equal with everybody has to be treated, no discrimination. Everybody yeah. has a chance to be in health or to have a treatment. Um, and then autonomy, you have the right to not, you have no obligation, you have the right uh, to choose their, their doctor, choose to be vaccinated or not, choose to find um, a, a, you know, a, a way to be healthy or not with your family, etc. So these are the four principles in ethics and bioethics uh, that I think are very good as you know a basis for everything we do with well, coronavirus too. Well, that that's that is true. Um, I know that Edward is uh, very keen on his Lifetime Awards inclusive discussion mm -hmm. platform, which breaks some of the uh, some of the uh, questions that you're talking about so that we look forward to seeing more about that uh, in fu some future talks but I know you are helping telewellness um, create rate a rating for COVID treatments aren't you you're this is something you're actively doing at the moment right. amongst yes. other things uh, we can't talk a lot about that because mm. that would take us in another direction but I'm just saying that I know you're involved and I'm very grateful that you are because your expertise is very well appreciated. Yeah, I could add that, you know, having been working in my whole life at the Faculty of Medicine with doctors and the healthy population and, and sick population, um, the methodology of science can change depending on the specialty. Yeah. A trial at the bed of the patient is not the same as 
um, what you develop for the population is not the same. So we have to take together the best science possible with very clear criteria of what is good science, that it is reliable, everybody is included, that old people are included in the trials, are included in the reflection, man-woman difference, for example, to children's specificity to, and that we can select the best scientists, the best science that has no conflict of interest and that is really there um, with systematic reviews, you know, reviews in journals that have proven uh, to be really there ethically for the population and, you know, uh, not, <laughs> no, no politicization, you know, yeah, to try yeah. and bring back a new medicine which really respects the criteria or ethical criteria that we all have in clinical mm -hmm. studies, in population studies, but also including, you know, other um, factors than just medicine. Like I just said before with epigenetics, it's that the social determinants of health are important that people meet, that, you know, happiness is also a factor, what mm -hmm. you eat, or, you know, so, uh, so um, I'm, well, I'm sure that uh, animals, this is a great doctor. Doctor, we are social animals. We, we rely <laughs> on meeting each other, you know, hugging, kissing, yeah. touching, because we have all these senses to, to, and for centuries we've grown used to having them. And so to not have them uh, or not be able to use them is, is, is distressing in itself in, in one, just one simple sentence. And I know that you're, you, you are very keen to find a way for people to like, almost mass adopt answers that say ah well this is actually good for you because da da and it works and it can work for anybody not just people who have only got one hand or you, you know what i mean yes you, you, there are some things we can standardize you know like vitamin c is good for everybody even if you take too much it goes through the urine but um there are this 4 p.m the four P medicine is very important. There's a personalization of, of um, medicine and health. You, yeah. what, what, what will correspond to you will not correspond to someone else and to optimize your health, you need to personalize it. So you need to know, you know, and detect how the body, the metabolism and that every solution is adapted to the person and its context. Then the three other Ps are predictive medicine. For example, diabetes. If, if I measure you today and then in, in, in one year and you haven't moved and you have been eating hamburgers and, <laughs> and uh, junk food, we can predict that uh, your metabolism is, is going to increase uh, towards diabetes uh, type yeah. two. And you can do that with many um, problems, but you can also do it for the solutions. So that's predictive, preventive, because we know, you know that some things uh, prevent uh, disease mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, if you brush your teeth and you have a good uh, oral hygiene, you know it is preventive of um, cognitive problems, yep. Yep. also of uh, bacteria in your heart, and the oral health is very important. So that's like it's an example of prevention. And the fourth one is participative. We need people to give their opinion and share how they react to things, how uh, healthy they are, what are their solutions they can bring to yep. everybody. So, four P predictive preventive personalized and participative <laughs> that's a way to to present this to, to people so it's easier to understand and, there are many you, solutions. and you deal with all of these areas don't you on a day-to-day -day basis in trying to help people whether they be a personal person or an organization or a government or just a group of scientists all getting together so that you can convey that the four P's are incredibly important going forward. Yes. Um, you see, we, we are in a society where science and technology has advanced incredibly fast. Mm. Uh, medicine has a linear thinking, but technology and science is exponential. So we have to use this technology uh, to detect, uh, to measure our metabolism, our health, the best way we can and, yep. then, um, and then give new solutions. And you were mentioning something very important before. It's the senses. One of the new signs uh, of uh, health and medicine is um, olfaction, for example. Yeah. Uh, so the nerves that are behind your nose are the ones that are the most powerful for regeneration for the brain. So the breathing and essential oils, flowers, for example, the rose 
has been studied and now you can understand why it's it's the flower of love because it's it's the flower the rose that has the most potent um is essences to regenerate the brain wow. so because everybody's going to smell roses now but um it's just to say that there is no doctor of olfaction but because of the swabs in the nose with covid we really need mm -hmm. to clean the nose with um you know salted water with uh uh, things that we don't try Help. not to go yeah. in this in this area because it's very sensitive. So that's one sense. Then you have the vision. Of course, it's very important. What you look at and what you see determines also the vibration of the light, which is studied today and can have an effect on your mind, on mm -hmm. your brain, on your on your depression or not. Mm -hmm. It's the same with bioacoustics. The way you speak, uh, the voice. Now, yes. MIT has studied that, and many others. The voice is um, expression of your healthy state or not. So every molecule has a wave, every wave has a frequency, and the frequency of your speech, how you speak, can express if there is something that your, your body needs. And you, you can even today, and this is still a bit experimental, but it's already for um, some... Um, Diseases like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson, you can detect by the voice, of course. But, and but there are now anti notes where you could send back a note to um, <laughs> to recalibrate your vibration. So this is a completely new area, uh, which is very interesting. I think that we're going to make a lot of progress in the future uh, to find how you can help yourself to feel better. You know, you know very well when you listen to music. When you go in a cathedral and you have, um, you know, some sacred geometry, yeah. it's been studied Indeed. too. The bioacoustics yeah. are amazing. And um, we need to get also, you know, light, music, all the senses are very important, especially with COVID-19, where people have been had masks, swabs, uh, confined. We need to, you know, to open up to tele to the wellness, tele-wellness, <laughs> and to find new solutions for... I'm, I'm told that things like voice recognition of uh, for people with, say, COVID-19 or other illnesses can be is is within the capability of people. Now, we just aren't familiar with it. Is this something that you are seeing more of, doctor? Yeah, I, I've been involved in the, with the United States with a company who uh, we try to find, um, a, you know, how. Uh, the PCR could uh, be matched with the uh, bioacoustics uh, elements. Right. Um, the difficulty is that the only way to really detect a virus is by sequencing the virus, the sequencing the genome. I see. Yeah. So uh, it's it's difficult. It's a challenge. Yeah, because at the moment, really, the variants, coronaviruses, are from the, the family of the flu. They are known since many years, you know, 25 years mm -hmm. more, um, but they mutate all the time. So it's a flu, sometimes severe like it has, but it mutates all the time. They have never found a vaccine up to today. And as it mutates, it's very difficult to, to detect on the voice because you don't know which mutation it is. So no, no. you see, symptomatic is still something important in medicine. People are yep. sick if they have symptoms. They're not sick mm -hmm. if they don't have symptoms. So it is really new science. That's what I want to say. It's, um, it's work in progress. And I hope we will find you know, ways also to measure people who are healthy, not, not just uh, you know, a standardized a virus that is changing all the time. There, there is really a challenge, scientific ethical challenge with COVID-19. Let me ask a question. Do you think that repurposing drugs, existing medicine, is a good thing? Because some of the things that we've used in the past may be ideal for helping us overcome uh, COVID-19. Yeah, of course. The, actually, you know, there's so many studies that have shown on and on since 30, 50 years in Africa, in the world, uh, that are usually going for parasites, for example, but work with uh, treating something like with the symptoms of COVID, even if it's not, in three, four days. Ivermectin, for example, is one of the treatments with no secondary effect, very easy to find. So that works. 
uh, of course, antibiotic like azithromycin are like have a large spectrum for bacteria. And when you have a, a flu, you can develop, you know, bacterial infection. It can mm -hmm. come from your teeth because you're. In, so these are are very known. Uh, you know, antibiotics are very known uh, medications yes, and treatments. Yes. And also, you know, everything, you know, um, to thin the, the blood, because this blood clot problem that we've seen with uh, with this flu evolving uh, situation is, is clot. Mm -hmm. So also very uh, simple aspirins are very helpful um, to avoid that. But the main thing that has been studied for it with um, the whole since one year, that there's enough science around to make sure that there is no harm, but only good for the regeneration of the cell are three things mainly. It's vitamin C, vitamin yep. D3, and zinc. But vitamin C, you know, has been studied in the protocol of Merrick, Dr. Merrick in the United States. He had a whole section of infectious ICU, uh, very, very severe cases, and one day, he had read, you know, a lot of the Nobel Prize uh, Linus polling on vitamin C and everything. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to try injection of um, vitamin C. And he tried with one, the person survived, the other not. And then he started making a protocol. And this has been documented as an incredibly cheap, but very efficient. in not only in infectious disease, but in, in radionuclear and, and in uh, cancer to help the cell get rid of its toxicity. Wow. Zinc also is good and then vitamin d is very interesting because um it if you don't have enough vitamin d you can measure that very easily in a ma in a lab yeah vitamin d is the sun but if you don't have enough it can create depression <laughs> so it it's the proof that depression is not just psychological it's not just as having a bad day it can actually be yeah. caused by lack of vitamin d yeah it's, it's your your body it's a metabolic depression it's like a car that you know, uh, is not working very well, <laughs> yeah. and it is your your engine is not optimal. So let, we have to look at our body like an engine. Indeed, that we, we have a part in it as a chief of orchestra in our mind, but but really we have to take very good care of our senses and our body, um, and be very aware of that. We have the power on our health. Uh, I think <laughs> it's also um, interesting to hear you talk about that. Because a lot of people, I think, are feeling at those, this time that they aren't in control of anything. And yet we need to hear more people like your good self saying, well, actually, you are. You're, you're probably in control of more of it than you think. Uh, but we're not yes. being told that. So uh, I thank you for sharing with us uh, because I know you're a big yeah, sharer. See, yeah, the fear uh, factor is, is is terrible. And I really... You know, ethically, what I uh, we were teaching uh, with the WHO in the International Health Regulation was that you communicate uh, not to create fear, but to reassure people. We don't yeah. know what's going on, but we're looking for it. And here are some solutions. And yeah. you talk about health. And this is this is missing in the rhetoric. So yeah. you have yeah. to create it yourself and with your family. So. What I just said, you know, nature, you just go <laughs> and walk barefoot in the grass and do something that keeps you, takes you back to who you are. Your body is natural. It's your natural oh, walking, walking barefoot in grass <laughs> is incredibly good for you, isn't it? As it, I, yes. I'm sure you knew by taking that one single example that grass in your feet and the natural earth beneath it is yeah. incredibly grounding at, 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 as well as anything else. Yeah, even in ice. And then you sing, and then you smell flowers, and then you get back to your natural state. No, it's very simple things, but actually at the moment, because of fear, I think that people have to just get back to singing, dancing in front of the mirror, but, you know, get back to this vibration of life. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, we're, uh, sadly, we're running out of time, Dr. <laughs> uh, Astrid, for, for further, much further talk. I'm hoping that you're going to agree to come back on and talk to me more about some of the things like repurposing and uh, finding ways of beating coronavirus. So, uh, sorry, yes. COVID-19, so that we can all all enjoy um, hearing from you a bit more. Yes, uh, yes, of course. And, and, you know, keep healthy because, uh, of course, there are people who have lost dear ones. And I, it's, it's uh, really awful. Uh, grief is, is a huge problem, uh, you know, how to heal after losing people and having fear so 
I'd be glad to come back and we can get more so into that. Uh, then the questions of, of your audience, you know, they can maybe also. Well, I'm sure we, we can arrange that. And Edward is very good at um, sorting these things out. But I, th I think just you've touched on something that I think is particularly important is that if you've managed to unfortunately lose people because of COVID-19, uh, it's it goes to show that this thing should be taken seriously yes. and we shouldn't flaunt the rules just because we feel good and we've had two jabs of something. We should actually help, try and help ourselves by helping others who are maybe not as strong as we are and can overcome these things easily or more so than in than other people yes and a grief takes a year that was one of my first study was grief in old people and it, it is very difficult for a man more than women in general but because women speak more but but we can you know uh, but it takes really a year of living alone and starting again and often what is difficult is that the ritual of saying goodbye has not been accomplished so there are other rituals you know to, to say goodbye and Yes, yes. Um, to get, yeah. Our, our own queen is going through that very same process at the moment, as probably the world knows, uh, and yes. you included. But at this moment in time, all I can say to you, Dr. Astrid, is thank you for sparing the time to talk to us today. You're welcome, and I think we'll uh, adjourn to another month and another time and get you back and talk, talk more specifically about some other things so that mm -hmm. we can share in what has been a lovely way to talk yes thank you and um you know they say say well and happy everybody I think.